In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about variable rates of change, which is a, a new concept we'll be exploring. Uh, so, not all functions have constant rates of change. We know that linear functions do, um, but there are functions that don't, and these types of functions are called functions that have variable rates of change, or in other words, a changing slope. It has a slope that constantly changes. Um, so, what we will look at is a particular example. Let's, let's say that we have the equation y equals 2.1x plus 3. Okay, so we know we have an initial value of 3. So when x is 0, y is 3. And then for every increase of, by, of 1 in the input, the output increases by 2.1. So we would have 5.1, we'd have 7.2, and then we would have 9.3. Okay, well, let's look at another column here. So I'm going to create another column, and I'm going to call this change in y over change in x. Well, I know that all of the in inputs are increasing by 1, so it's always going to be over 1. In other words, between here and here, I know that my output increases by 2.1 per a 1 unit change in my input. So the rate of change is a 2.1. Similarly here, we would have 5.1 to 7.2 is a change of 2.1, and the input changes by 1 unit. So the rate of change would be 2.1. Uh, similarly, fi or finally, for between these two values, I would have 2.1 over a one unit change in the input, which would give me a slope of 2.1. So in this case, my change in y and change in x is constant, and therefore that tells me that I have a, a linear function. But not all functions are this way. Let's take a look at one example. The following table shows the estimated five-year fatality rate for patients who have recently been diagnosed with lung cancer. Um, so let's just analyze the rates of change. So what I'm going to look at is my, my, my output is the fatality rate, my input is the years. So I'm going to look at a column that looks at the change in the fatality rate over the change in time. Okay, well, I'm going to look at pairs of side-by-side -side values here. In other words, between uh, two, 1991 and 1994, the, fa the fatality rate dropped by 0.6 a negative 0.6 per, and that's across three years. Okay, well, negative 0.6 divided by three gives me negative 0.2, and that's percentage points per year. But then I look at the next year, and I notice that there's a that there's a drop of uh, looks like um, 0.6, and that appears to be across four years. So already I know that this is not a constant rate of change. In fact, I get negative 0.15 percent per year. Um, and then finally, between these two years I have a drop of 1.5 and that's across six years. And so that comes out to about um, negative 0.25 which again is a different rate of change. So it's negative 0.25 percent per year. Well, what we're trying to get at here is that number one, this has a variable rate of change. Uh, F is a function of time. In other words, fatality rate is a function of time, but the rate of change is not constant. Now we could do linear regression on it if we feel that the slopes are fairly stable, and you look at these, and they're fairly close to negative 0.2, all of them. So you might tell yourself, well, it's a approximately linear. And so you might say, well, I'm going to use linear regression to find the best fitting uh, equation that will basically find me the best fitting slope. Um, but we can technically say that this has a, a variable rate of change. So I'll just say VROC for variable rate of change. So then our, our next question might be, well, what, what do we do with this? How does this help us? Well, it, the thing that I want, I want, I think it's important to begin thinking about is, well, how, what does this represent graphically? If I know that in 1991, there was a rate of change of 86, and then two, three, three years later, I know that the rate of change was negative 0.2, that means I know that it went down. So I'm gonna pretend like that right there represents the drop. Okay, well, why am I doing that? Well, I know that 
in year eight, five, six, seven, eight, the rate of change is not quite as it's not quite as big of a drop. So there's my drop. Going three years, I would have to go down 0.2. But then going over four years, I only go down 0.15. Or sorry, uh, for every one year, I go down 0.15. So my slope would be a little bit less steep. So it's kind of a little steeper, a little less steep. And then suddenly I have this negative 0.25, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And so now the slope gets a little steeper and begins to drop a little faster. So I guess this is kind of a bad illustration, but um, the goal was to show that where it started, it dropped by a little bit. Then the next drop between the next two points was a little less. And then the next drop between the next two points was a little greater. So actually, these points aren't quite linear. But overall, it seems that they have kind of a linear pattern. And I could probably use linear regression to find a line of best fit. Next, let's take a look at a movie. Uh, the earnings for a movie. These are the gross revenues. And this was for a movie called Taken 2, which I just happened to pick uh, one day to take a look at. And these are, so for since the day it came out, or based on the day that it came out, here are the, the gross revenues and millions of dollars earned from all the movie theaters. So day one, the movie made $18.36 million. Day two, it made $18.94 million. So here's what we're going to look at. We're, we're getting to look at the rates of change, the change in the amount of revenue earned divided by the change in day. Well, if I look at the first two days, 18.36 to 18.94 represents a growth of 0.58. Now that is across one day, so our rate of change would be change in G would be 0.58, change in D would be 1. And so we'd be talking about an increase of 0.58 million dollars across one day. So that it went up by 0.58 million dollars per day. Now that's only for one day, but it's still per day. From day two to day three, there was actually a drop. Maybe it was after the weekend, and so now it went from 18.94 down to 12.21, which represents a drop of 6.73 million dollars over the course of one day. So I, again, would have negative 6.73 million dollars per day. And if we repeated that for all these values, we would get the corresponding numbers here. And they're all over 1, because notice that our days are in sequences of 1. OK, so having found all of this, what can we conclude, or how would the graph appear? If we were to model gross earnings across the day, what would we expect to see? Well, I know it's very tempting to want to plot all these points and sketch it out exactly, but let's try this. I know that on I'm going to label 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. On day 1, I'll just pretend like this is 18.36. So from day 1 to day 2, I know there was an increase. So I'm just going to model that increase of 0.58 over the course of one day, 0.58 million up. And then the next day, it dropped by 6.73. So I have a, a big drop of 6.73 over the course of that next day. It maybe looks like that. It's a big drop. And then I have another big drop of 6.71. So over the next day, it looks like that. And then a drop of 1.55, which is just a, which is a little bit, a lot less, actually. And then a drop of 1.17, which is, again, a little bit less. And then a drop of 0.27, which is just a little bit more. And then suddenly, maybe it's the weekend again, and we get a big increase in the revenues. So maybe it would look roughly like this. This is just our sketch. And what we're doing is we're using the rate of change to help us predict the shape of the graph, how fast it goes up versus how fast it goes down. Now, in reality, here's what the actual graph looks like. Now, notice that we weren't that far off. We kind of had the, the, the rough kind of elongated shape, almost the S shape. The data is just a little bit more precise. But you can see there's that small increase. There's that small increase that we were talking about, that 0.58 in one day. Then the drop in the next day. Then another drop that, that's a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit more, a little bit less. And then we have that increase, because it's probably the weekend again. So notice we didn't do too bad in our sketch. And that's kind of the whole purpose, or the, the importance of thinking in this type of way. 
is to be able to say not only, okay, based, I can plot a bunch of values, but I can think about the rate of change and what it's telling me to do next when I sketch the next point. So all we're doing is just, I like to think of this as curve sketching. We're just curve sketching based on new information that we can have in our table. And this is a really important skill to have because it allows us to think about what we would expect to happen next. Okay, so let's, let's now compare two situations. Let's say we have the function y equals, change something here real quick. We have the equation y equals 2x plus 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a little table that allows me to compare my x and y values. Uh, sorry, the way out I'm going to label this is is to have uh, the 2x plus 1 labeled in the next column instead of having uh, say, calling it y. So 2x plus 1. If x is 0, my 2x plus 1 will be equal to 1 because 2 times 0 plus 1 is 1. Um, if I increase x to 1, I'll have 2 times 1 is 2 plus 1 is 3. And so every time I increase the input by 1, the output should increase by 2. I increase the input by 1, the output should increase by 2. Okay, so you can see that if I compared the change in y over the change in x, I'd have 2 over 1, 2 over 1, 2 over 1. And so I know that right now my rate of change is constant. So if I were to plot this thing, I would say at 0, the output is 1. When x is 1, it increases by 2. When x is 2, we have an increase of 2. x is 3, increase of 2. And so we see that the rate of change is constant. We get the straight line shape. Okay. Well, let's say now I also looked at the value of x squared. So what I'm doing now is I am uh, also looking in a separate column at the values of squaring the x's. So if I put in 0, I'll have 0 squared is 0. 1 squared is 1. 2 squared is 4. 3 squared is 9. Okay, so notice that the values of x squared, the change in y is 1, the change in x is 1. So I would have a slope of 1. From 1 to 4, we have an output increase of 3, but the input still only increased by 1. So my slope actually increases to 3 when I'm dealing with this x squared function. From 4 to 9, I have an increase of 5. And again, the input increases by 1, so my slope would be 5. Now again, I'm only comparing this column to my x column to see what happens to the slopes. Okay, now let's suppose I add 2x plus 1 and I add x squared to it. So that means I'm going to take basically the value here plus the value here. So 1 plus 0 is 1. 3 plus 1 is 4. 5 plus 4 is 9. 7 plus 9 is 16. And now let's observe what, what the graphs look like, the difference between having the x squared plus 2x plus 1 versus just the 2x plus 1. Well, if I add the x squared to it, then the output of 1 right here would still be 1 for this function. Let me change my pen color. Um, when the input is 1, the output for 2x plus 1 is 3, but the output for this guy is 4, so it's a little bit higher. So it actually, the function kind of goes like that. Now, when x is 2, the output of 2x plus 1 is 5, but x squared plus 2x plus 1 is 4 units higher. So, in fact, here was a change of 1, but now it's actually 4 units higher. Oops. It's actually 4 units higher, so that the graph actually appears like it's increasing at a faster rate. And then when x is 3, 2x plus 1 is 7, but x squared plus 2x plus 1 is 9 units higher, and it's way up here at 16. Way up here. So I'm just trying to draw the relativity so you can see how much bigger this function ends up getting. So what we're trying to demonstrate is by adding that x squared, your function quickly deviates away from the line, that adding these squares to it, now notice again that the rate of change is 3 over 1, 5 over 1. 7 over 1. So our slopes are getting consistently higher. And this is just something that we'll touch on in this entire chapter.